So I've just accomplished one of my childhood dreams with the camera walking in front of me. I always wanted to be on this show in the U.S. It's called The Price is Right. If any of you have seen it where they follow you as you go on stage, you spin a big wheel, you win some things. And then sometimes you win like this trip to a resort like St. Martin's. So um, I've just taken care of that. I can check it off my list. I want to thank um, Eugene and Sergey and Ryan and Juan for um, inviting me here. Um, and I also want to apologize to Eugene officially now because I did not know at the time, but five years ago when I invited uh, Eugene to come and speak at Georgetown at my conference that I do on cyber engagement, I didn't realize how boring of a place I was asking him to come to, um, to the campus in Washington, D.C., and I didn't realize places where he usually um, has events, so I apologize. So I have about 20 minutes to talk to you all um, this morning, and I'll have some room for a Q&A. Uh, and I have about four hours of content and material that I'd like to discuss. So we're going to have to compress that into the 20 minutes. Um, in my defense, I'm a lawyer by training. So even typically when I have about 20 minutes of content, it often takes me about four hours to talk about it and explain it. So I'm going to be talking about cyber threat intelligence and how that profession in the world that you all live and work in every day may be threatening some of the traditional intelligence operations conducted by governments, um, their intelligence agencies and their security services. And where the world is right now in these kind of fields colliding, so to speak. So what is a fact is that every day in your work and what you do as cybersecurity researchers, malware analysts, cyber threat uh, intelligence analysts, you push the envelope of technology. Just like technology pushes the envelope of society and what society we as individuals or countries have come to accept as the rules of behavior, so to speak. But each day when you do your job, what you are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis are often both moral, ethical, and legal dilemmas. And whether you're addressing them in real terms or not, um, or deciding and making decisions by acts of omission, they are there. So what I would like to do today is to talk about some of the scenarios that may come up while you conduct your work. And then, while there may not be clear answers now, but at least to start kind of putting some thoughts so your creative thinking might be sparked on it, to think about how you may resolve some of these uh, dilemmas, if possible. So to begin with, I come from a government background. I worked in the US government for most of my um, career, professional career, and particularly the intelligence community. So, from my view and analyzing some of the dilemmas that malware analysts may have to deal with, I come at it from a government perspective. So for a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about the public sector and its role when it comes to cyber threat intelligence and more broadly, the work of intelligence agencies across the globe. So we likely everyone realizes that the role of governments in collecting intelligence and conducting espionage or spying is referred to often as the second oldest profession in the world. Virtually all governments and nation states conduct espionage and intelligence collection. They of course do it under their own rules that their government has set forth and yes those rules vary but as a general rule under international law espionage and cyber or foreign intelligence collection is not regulated under international law, meaning it is not illegal. There are no treaties that states have agreed to prohibiting this behavior. Um, and yet each government in its own jurisdiction, just about every country has outlawed the act under its domestic laws. So cy cyber kind of arises out of the birth, if you will, or the in invention of the internet. And countries, just as with other domains, like the air and sea and land, they viewed this domain as another domain in which they could affect nation state policies. 
And in this regard, the subject of cyber threat intelligence, it was one more forum, if you will, in which states could, in using their intelligence assets of their national security agencies, collect foreign intelligence, analyze foreign intelligence through cyber-enabled means, and then sometimes in the area of counterintelligence or covert action, you may be doing more than just collecting and analyzing the intelligence. But for today, we're talking a lot about the collection and analysis of it, and as researchers, what kind of issues may, you may have to grapple with when you're now doing the work that intelligence agencies have done for a long time. So intelligence agencies, I've said, each government kind of dictates how their government is going to operate in their intelligence services, and they have sets of rules. My experience, of course, is with the U.S. government intelligence agencies, although I've worked overseas with liaison services. But my familiarity is with the rules that control how U.S. intelligence agencies operate. And so we follow the international laws that we've agreed to, and then we follow the laws that Congress pass or that the president has issued through executive orders. And with respect to the intelligence community, there are also not just laws like our Constitution that we have to operate under, but also ethical principles and guidelines that have been developed that may not be codified in statutes. Here is where you get a lot of the, the ethical dilemmas that have arisen over the years with intelligence services, where we've come to a compromise about how we as a nation are going to operate. So, to, some, to give you some examples, because it may, the analogies will be relevant on the cyber um, in a few minutes when I bring up the scenarios, there are a lot of rules that have come to be accepted in terms of uh, one of them, it's related to counterterrorism, counter but we're, the use of dirty assets in terms of uh, recruiting and infiltrating organizations, that the U.S. has decided that that is not what we want our intelligence community on a day-to-day -day basis to do. The use of private entities, companies, and individuals, either for cover as an intelligence operation or to do the collection for an intelligence agency also has certain, there are rules involved in using those special individuals or US companies. And then there are a class of specially protected individuals. And this is where I wanna come back for some of your work. These rules were developed not as a matter of law that Congress passed, but based on ethical ideas of what we wanted the U.S. government to do or not do, and it related to groups of people like the Peace Corps, um, journalists, and clergy. So over the years, there have been limitations in terms of what the intelligence community can do or not do with respect to using these entities as cover in conducting their intelligence collection operations or to make them, use them as operational use where they were going to be collecting for the U.S. government. Now, to some of the scenarios that I think may be relevant for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, as you're collecting intelligence, what we're seeing in the cyber domain is there's a convergence of a number of factors where now the lines are becoming blurred. One, at a higher level, between war and peace. We had a set of rules that operated in two different domains, whether in war and peace. These, the arena of war and peace and cyber seemed to be blurred. But also the role of private sector and government, where traditionally you lived in your stovepipes or in your lanes of operation. Today in the cyber domain, these are merging. And it is at this threat, cyber threat intelligence area that you have the great, greatest amount of blurring of lines where companies are actually doing things that may historically been the operations of intelligence services. And what do you do when what you're analyzing, say a piece of malware, if you disclose it or release it, may actually compromise the operation of a national security agency? Now some might say, one of the ethical uh, elements that you might wanna think about and analyzing what to do when you discover a piece of malware that might be being used by a government for what might be considered benevolent purposes is to think about the intent of those that are um, deployed and are using the malware. But that's only one element of what you might want to think about. In terms of reporting what you find in your research, dilemmas may come up with respect to who you report it to. Is it your paid customers only, those that you're obligated to protect and secure, 
Or should it be the broader community, maybe the international community of other researchers, so they might then take action necessary to secure everyone from these vulnerabilities, including, and does it matter if those that are vulnerable to these kinds of attacks may be hospitals and other social services that mankind globally would depend on? So how do you make these decisions? Well, certainly, if you're a researcher that's sitting within a company, it is a business decision often that needs to be considered. And it's not one just about an individual's thought of what is the right and wrong thing to do. One thing in terms of the journalist topic that I wanted to come to, years ago, and this developed over many years, um, the intelligence community in the United States government has a, let's say, traditionally a distant relationship with the media. Sometimes it's very contentious, as you read about in the papers. But over time, with respect to the intelligence operations of the government, journalists or independent researchers writing, of course, pre-internet age, would often come into possession of classified information, information about an ongoing intelligence operation, an espionage operation. At times, those journalists, independent researchers, authors, would reach out to the intelligence community in the US government officials of government agencies, people they got to know over the years that they knew were working in these agencies, and would give the government notice as to what they were going to print, what they found. And in many cases, those that I was familiar with starting in the 90s when I started working at CIA, but it predated any of my time there, many times the intelligence community would invite these journalists and authors in to discuss with them, with the hopes of preventing the disclosure of national security secrets, and reveal to the journalist, um, the news media, um, in private, why, if they were releasing this information, it may compromise US national security. Now, the resolution of those meetings didn't always go the way the government wanted. Sometimes the journalist would accept what the government was saying, take it at face value, and still say that for various reasons they felt that this needed to be publicly disclosed. And sometimes they did that. Other times, though, the journalists were able to work with the government, and I know a number of cases where they said, well, tell me what is the most sensitive aspects of this reporting that you think would be detrimental, whether it's costing the lives of individuals or basically requiring operations to be compromised. And sometimes they would hold back on disclosing these particular elements. Now, usually it is a negotiation between the two parties. And then there were other times, even in recent history, with the surveillance um, leaks, where some of the journalists, when they had the story back in 2005, they would agree to delay the release of this information. Now, in your world of malware analysts, it is not a perfect scenario. And I'm not necessarily saying there's an obligation in which to work with any particular government. And I also do realize it's not just one government, right? There may be many governments that are at issue here that you might come across their intelligence operations. But I do think we're at a stage, as with the relationship between the media or the press and journalists and the government, particularly the intelligence community, years ago, over time, there was a relationship that developed at least where there would be someone you knew, outsiders knew, who to call if they wanted to share information with the government and had some concerns about anything that they were about to disclose. It may not work, and it does not work always in the physical realm, but in terms of the cyber research on malware, I do think that there's a role that could be played, and it doesn't have to be that one is compromising the other industry. Right? There will always be a separation, at least in the US, between the freedom of press and First Amendment and the US government. And there are plenty of lawyers that will have to deal when things don't go well between those two different sectors. But on a day-to-day -day level, when you have to get the work you need to do for the better of your customers or the broader community when it comes to cybersecurity, this may be an area where to my knowledge, I haven't seen this yet develop. And there may be bumps in the road, as I said, as you go along. That's just one ethical scenario 
that I've thought of in terms of when you actually get information. Now, the challenges though is attribution is not perfect, and I do think it also can work in the reverse, that governments can also go to the private sector and researchers, sharing information that they can share with the researchers so that there's a way that you can meet in the middle. Now, the interests, the missions of these two groups will never be aligned. The government's mission, and coming from a United States government perspective, the National Security Agency's mission is to protect the nation. And at times, that requires things that might not be acceptable by those in the private sector, individual citizens. And companies also have different motives or missions. One, typically, is to make money and to stay in business. So whether it's a business decision that a company has to make with ethical dilemmas built within it, or a government decision made from the premise of national security that also has ethical dilemmas built in it, I do think that the two arenas can actually work better together. The cybersecurity field of research could do better in terms of working with the government and certainly the US government, I know less about foreign governments, could do better in terms of opening avenues of discussion with this field of researchers and companies. So I think on by the timer, I have eight minutes, so I do want to ask, and that thing is going fast, so I do want to ask if there are questions that can focus on more of the scenarios. Sergey, is that okay if I open it up? Okay, does anyone have any question? It's not really, there are a number of different scenarios that I came up with and thought about. I'd be happy to talk to anyone later on further about them, um, and we can sit we have, down. We have two microphones on both sides of the room. I have a question in the back. Uh, in the back here. So I, I wanted to ask if you have any experience with cases where intelligence agencies can leak information to the private sector because they want somehow that information to go public, whether it's an intelligence operation from another, another country or something that they are, you know, they just want the public to know. Yep. So now my view, you may think that it's biased since I worked in the government, but it, it is just kind of how I view these things. So there are at times situations and scenarios where the US government has certain information and that cannot be publicly announced by the US government. And it could be for various reasons. It could be because coming from the government, it can't be denied once the government comes out and publicly says something, then it no longer can be denied to foreign governments, right? That they won't be able to hide the fact that the US government knew this information and disclosed it. But there are a number of other reasons why the government agencies will at times decide that it itself cannot publicly announce something. And they have gone in the past to different private entities or to journalists themselves, given them what's called background information, where the journalists then on their own, all right, this is an independent decision, at least as the US government wouldn't force um, under our, at least our legal system, someone to do that. But then it is up to that independent journalist company to decide whether they want to release it, right? So there are reasons, and I think valid reasons, but I do wanna say one thing about that, because one very important aspect of if the government is gonna do that, and when it does that, in my opinion, the very critical thing is that they need to make sure that the information that they're passing is accurate, right? Otherwise, they would have, in terms of intelligence rules, under the intelligence community rules of blowback, if the United States government intelligence agency, for instance, hypothetically was giving false information out in the US to a user, either US media or private sector, that would be considered in violation of these rules of blowback, right? Not to influence the US public and our citizens, right? With false information. So, but there are many scenarios where if it is accurate and truthful information, the government would have some credible reasons why they could not come out officially and say it themselves, but might allow or ask another entity to do that. Hello, good morning. Arturo Di Corinto. La Repubblica, Italy. So you say that uh, the National Security Agency uh, was uh, going to protect the country when did what uh, it did, but uh, 
Julian Assange, Snowden uh, showed us that it was not so. Uh, so could, could you please be more accurate about it? And second, uh, you are talking about uh, the necessity to exchange information between independent researchers, journalists, and the government, but it seems that it never happens. And I want to know if you are for a bargain or for a compromise. Thank you. Okay, so the first one, I think I heard him correctly. It was the question on um, like Snowden revelations and what they revealed about the U.S. government. So I'll take one scenario because it's been asked, my students have asked me about this particularly, and it was very public, in terms of uh, Angela Merkel being quite upset and others that a phone um, was being surveilled, her personal phone. And some of my students asked me, why would the intelligence community um, need to listen in on a foreign head of state in terms of their conversations and maybe private conversations? Well, there are reasons why, in term, well, let's back it up. The rules in terms of the US laws with respect to intelligence collection. On foreign intelligence, when you're collecting foreign intelligence, targeting a former head of state or a current head of state or an, an anyone in a foreign government is legitimate as long as you have a business reason, national security reason. Now, another controversial aspect was kind of listening in and surveilling members of the UN, right, or the UN Secretary General. So there are reasons why there may be conversations that another head of state is having with countries or other foreign leaders that the United States is not party to and, for our purposes, would like to know what those conversations are about. So European countries have relationships with other countries that the U.S. does not have relationships with. This happened also in the lead up to the Iraq war, discussions at the UN that's been discussed and disclosed, part of what's been leaked, in terms of the U.S.'s interest in knowing what the negotiations were with other countries that were not being disclosed to the United States government. So on the surveillance of foreign governments and foreign government officials, although it was a sensitive issue for President Obama to deal with with respect to Merkel, there are legitimate reasons why any government, depending on the circumstances, might want to know what that government, foreign government official is saying to other people. Now your second question was about the relationship and dialogue between journalists, I think, and the government. My examples that I was talking about were cases that I was very familiar with. So not related to the cyber field necessarily and not related to, in fact, I don't know any case where an independent or a researcher at a company who finds a piece of malware that might involve national security or government activity, I know of no case where there's an open dialogue or private between the two. What I was suggesting is that I have seen that done outside of cyber and malware analysis with journalists over time, and this goes back many, many years, who get access to national security classified information. And what they have done at times has come, they typically will come to the government because they want to comment. That leads to an open um, invitation where the government at times has invited those individuals in, maybe one or two, and disclosed to those individuals things that would not be publicly released, but they do that with that individual in order to explain how the information they have and want to release would damage specific operations and therefore US national security. From there though, it's up to the two parties to decide what they want to negotiate and it really is in the US up to the journalist to decide what he or she or their newspaper or organization wants to do. Sometimes the journalist refuses to cooperate and wants to publish and then the government has gone in some cases to for instance the editors of that newspaper and the editors there's one book that maybe you're familiar with it was the um, Ryzen book where he wanted to print the story his editors did not allow him to and it involved classified information he ultimately left and wrote his book so I suggest that maybe there's some relevance in how that worked in the past where it's always going to be a compromise 
Neither side will be very happy, likely, if they're agreeing to a compromise. But maybe there's a role for an open dialogue or at least a relationships between individuals, those in the national security space, and those in the malware um, research area. And that was kind of, it was, but I know not of this happening today. Catherine, thank you very much for your remarks. I have, a, I have a yes or no question from yeah. my side. I think okay. this is a very important conversation to have. Do you think it's ever appropriate for a security vendor to agree to whitelist uh, malware that, that a government says is being used for it? Do you think it's ever appropriate for a security vendor to, so to not play along, okay. to not detect? So if the, oh, oh, so government asks you not to release it? Not to release detection. Do you think it's appropriate for any security vendor to agree to that? To not releasing it. Correct. Okay. So as a lawyer, I say, I'm not going to tell you there's a law that allows or doesn't allow you to do that. It's more of this ethical and business decision. Personally, I'm, because I don't come from the private sector, right. I would say it's up to you. Now, it's up to, so same thing with some companies are, let's say, more in line with government mm -hmm. interests. Some people say maybe they're more patriotic because they came out of the government. Those people who decide to follow the lead of the government, that's their decision. But in the same respect, and if I was in the government and dealing with them, for a company that says no to the government, that's also very legitimate. Now, as long as, as a lawyer, I would say, as long as you're not violating any laws and disclosing that of the country in which you're either operate in or you're incorporated in. Yeah, but yeah. Course, it's a much more nuanced uh, uh, issue. But I, yeah. again, this is a very important conversation to have. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much, Catherine. Thank you.